Here is an illustration of a steel sheet piling installation. The workers here are engaged in installing a whaler. The whaler here is made up of double channels back to back with a space in between them. And the space is to accommodate the installation of tiebacks. So the method of supporting the steel sheet piling in this instance will be through the use of tiebacks. While we're here though, I wanted to point out the backhoe which is sitting on top of this bank. The backhoe is reaching inside to excavate material and place the material in the waiting dump truck, but you could see how close it is to the excavation. Now the backhoe is mounted on Caterpillar tracks and that distributes the load and spreads the load. And I'm sure what he's doing is perfectly safe, but I wanted to point out how invariably equipment comes very close to excavations. In this slide, the tiebacks are being installed. That's a drill that's drilling a hole through the space in the whaler and they will drill a hole into the earth in this case uh, sometimes into the rock but these i recall were earth anchors so a calculation has to be made as to how deep to drill the hole and then high strength steel rods or bundles of high strength cable are inserted into the hole and grouted in place when the grout is set a load is applied to the anchor to prove it, and the load is then locked into the whaler, and that's the system that ties back the steel sheet piling. This is an alternate system for bracing the steel sheet piling. In, in this case, it is done with pipe struts, The pipe struts bear against a whaler, which is attached to the steel sheet piling. And the pipe strut is a very efficient compression member, capable of carrying very high loads. You can see that as the width of the excavation increases, the dead load of the pipe strut becomes a very important factor. And pipe struts can grow to be 36 or even 48 inches in diameter. I've also had occasion where I've added cover plates, top and bottom, to the pipe strut in order to get it to span the distance that we needed. In some cases, it is even necessary to introduce intermediate supports because the distance is simply getting too great. The drawback of the intermediate support is that it will no doubt interfere with whatever it is you're trying to construct inside the excavation. So these are all factors that the engineer must take into account in first of all deciding should he use tiebacks, which would create an open obstruction-free excavation, or should he or she use uh, pipe struts as illustrated here and what's the most efficient spacing of the pipe struts, and when do you need to introduce intermediate supports in order to use lighter sections. This is a building site, and I would like to mention that there are two distinct disciplines within the civil engineering community. One is heavy construction, and the previous slides have demonstrated heavy construction, which is typically public work structures, highways, bridges, tunnels, uh, railroad facilities. And illustrated here in the photo is building construction, a different discipline. Both of them require civil engineering solutions to very complex supportive excavation challenges. Here, in the case of this building and many buildings, a different approach is taken. 
they need to excavate down to get to the foundation slab and that's uh, quite deep in the hole so they begin by excavating someplace in the middle of the hole and that leaves a good deal of undisturbed soil which is still capable of supporting the steel sheet piling i would like to point out that here again steel sheet piling is the method used around the perimeter of the excavation because of the presence of a very high water table you could not brace from one side of the excavation to the other the braces would be impractically long the presence of a lot of intermediate supports would make the further future construction uh, very, very difficult to achieve. Here is a detail from that foundation slab, and I want to point out these short, stubby columns, which have been cast into the slab, and they will be used in order to brace the steel sheet piling. This is the next stage of the operation. To begin with, horizontal whalers have been installed up against the sheet piling. And then incline braces are installed and they come to bear on these short stub columns which have been cast into the foundation slab. An incline brace like that is called a raker. And this method is called the raker method. When these inclined rakers have been installed, the backhoe can reach between them and excavate the area previously left undisturbed up against the sheeting. So the excavation is now taking place and it's bringing the grade down to a point uh, roughly equal to the top of the foundation slab. When the excavation is brought to the top of the existing previously built slab, then you're able to install these horizontal braces. These braces uh, also react against the short column cast into that slab. These horizontal members are struts or braces, and it's interesting to point out that they are pipe sections. As I mentioned before, the loads here have increased the deeper you go in the excavation, the greater the loads, and at this point it was felt that a pipe section would be better suited, whereas the inclined rakers were rolled sections. One advantage of the rolled section is that the end connections here are much simpler than they would be with a pipe section. After this horizontal brace has been installed, you can now further excavate to the subgrade that's uh, down at, uh, at this level. And you're now able to install the rebar and pour the foundation slab out to the steel sheeting. I want to point out, you can see some evidence here of uh, white uh, color under the uh, floor slab. You can also see this white area. That's a waterproofing membrane which has been placed. It's absolutely essential to waterproof any deep excavation, especially this one, which is below the water table. And this has been done by first placing a membrane and then constructing the floor slab or foundation slab on top of the membrane. It's beyond the scope of this lecture to go into the details of waterproofing concrete structures, a very complex and very important subject, but needs to be dealt with elsewhere. Now the Foundation slab has been poured right up to the steel sheeting. And 
the steel sheeting can react up against the foundation and that lower pipe strut can be removed. It has already been removed in this area, but here in an area where the concrete is in place yet, you can see all of the elements. So you begin here with an incline brace, which uh, I call a raker. You can then excavate further down until you're able to install this horizontal brace, which I would call a strut. And then you can excavate below that to get down to the subgrade. And you can then construct the next pour of the foundation slab. When that foundation slab is constructed, you can then remove the pipe strut. It's important to remove it because it will be in the way of the foundation wall, which would be the next element to be constructed. In this photo, the foundation wall is now being formed and you can see elements of it and all these men are engaged in that activity. They're putting up scaffolding and formwork for the exterior foundation wall for the building. As you can see, all of the incline braces are uh, remain in place and they must be in place to carry the load on the steel sheeting. They will have to be in place until the foundation wall is complete and is itself braced by floor slabs. And then the incline braces can be removed and the loads can be transmitted to the foundation wall. I'd also like to point out that here in the background, you can see the structural steel is already being erected. And this is called fast tracking. Instead of waiting for the entire foundation to be constructed, the structural steel can start at one end of the building and work productively even while the foundation construction continues. 